Boom. Boom. I'm recording now. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Oh. It's a mute. Oh. Hi. Mom, do you want to go? Eva, Eva, Eva. Good afternoon, Dr. Green. Welcome to the sixth annual Yamba Manly Lecture Series, brought to you by the Mission and Community Committee at First Presbyterian and Trinity Church. The Yamba Manly Lecture Series honors two prestigious scholars, Dr. Zachary Yamba, President Emeritus of Essex County College in Newark, New Jersey. Dr. Yamba is known for his extensive leadership that defines Essex County College. He's an unrelenting advocate for power and promise in education. Our second um, honoree is Dr. Robert H. Manley, the founder of the Center for Global Responsibility. Dr. Manley is a professor of political science at Seton Hall in South Orange, New Jersey. He was one of several Seton Hall University faculty members who laid down the foundation for the Seton Hall School of diplomacy and international relations. He's an active member of First Presbyterian and Trinity Church. Today's discussion will focus on the transatlantic uh, slave trade and the making of the modern world. The discussion will be hosted by Dr. Lily Edwards, Professor Emeritus of History and African American Studies at Jew University, and Dr. Larry Green, a professor of history in the Department of History Department of Seton Hall University. Before we begin, Reverend Valencia Norman will begin this event with a word of prayer. Hello, everyone. And it is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of all of our elders, our deacons, and the whole membership of the First Presbyterian and Trinity Church in South Orange. It has been our mission to continue to be on the front 
of issues that are of social justice, because for us, it is social justice to be also a follower of Christ. So we want to say welcome to this time. Um, welcome for our honorees, such a great, great honor to be able to say to Dr. Yamba and to uh, Dr. Manley that we honor you each time that we are joined together. So it is in the spirit of honoring our ancestors that we come together in prayer. So let's pray. God, you have always led us from times of past. You showed us what freedom was like. You gave freedom to our ancestors of faith, leading them out of slavery into the land of promise. And so today, as we honor the ancestors of Dr. Yamba and Dr. Manley, we also lift up the great work that they've done and the great work that will continue in their name. Help us to listen to the voices that will be presented today to, to teach us once again the, the, the great history that has happened through the slave trade and not only the history of God, but also to be aware of the ongoing need to be voices for freedom. So help us and lead us in this time of discussion, this time of sharing, a blessing that we are as we join together and just to hear one another. So we open this time in, in the sense of faith and the spirit of hope and in obedience to our ancestors. Amen. The lecture today will examine the relationship between the transatlantic slave trade, European expansion, and global competition for access to land and resources, as well as a monopoly over global trade from the 1500s to the 1800s. The audience will learn about the commodification of African people as chattel, movable, movable property, and the African resistance to dehumanization defined by the making of the modern world, its politics, culture, social institu institutions, and especially its wealth. Next, we'll have a brief introduction to our, about our speakers for this event by Susan Haig and Abigail Douglas Johnson. It's an honor to welcome both Dr. Edwards and Dr. Green. Dr. Lily Johnson Edwards is Professor Emerita of History and African American Studies at Drew University in Madison, where she served for 23 years, including as the founding director of the Pan-African Studies and director of American Studies. She received two teaching awards and two university faculty service awards there. Dr. Edwards is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Oberlin College, where she received the Distinguished Alumni Award in 2002. She currently serves on Oberlin's Board of Trustees, where she's chair of the Academic Affairs Committee, and she was former chair of Oberlin's 2017 Presidential Search Committee. Dr. Edwards received her doctorate from the University of Chicago. She has published several articles and her biography of Denmark VC for middle school students won the New York Public Library Book for the Teenage Award. As a public intellectual committed to bringing African-American studies to adults and students, Dr. Edwards consults with libraries, historical societies, museums, and school districts. Starting in 2002 and spanning two decades, she was a charter member of the New Jersey Amistad Commission, co-chair of its curriculum committee, and co-author co of the New Jersey Amistad Bill signed just this year by New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. Dr. Edwards is proud of her family roots in Columbus, Georgia. She is a life member of the NAACP and the Association of Black Women Historians. She currently uh, serves as the chair of the church council of the Mark Montclair, a United Methodist congregation in Montclair, New Jersey, where she and her husband, Paul Edwards reside. Welcome, Dr. Edwards. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Larry Green, we're thrilled to welcome you. We're thrilled to welcome Dr. Green, whose distinguished academic career is marked by generous service to the broader community and society. Dr. Green is professor of history at Seton Hall University, his alma mater, where he is the former chair of the history department and former director of the Multicultural Studies Program. 
He serves currently on and was chair of the New Jersey State Historical Commission Advisory Board. And at Drew University, he co-chairs the Board of Associates of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Dr. Green's courses at Seton Hall encompass a range of subjects, African-American history, slavery and abolition, the Civil War and Reconstruction Era, and the history of World War II. With John Duff, Dr. Green co-authored Slavery, Its Origins and Legacy, and Germans and African Americans, Two Centuries of Exchange with Anke Orthlip. He also co-authored the New Jersey Afro-American Curriculum Guide with Lenworth Galter and numerous articles in Jewish journals. He has served as advisor and consultant to elementary and higher education, editorial and New York public television boards, grant reviewer for the National Endowment for the Humanities and New Jersey Historical Commission. In 2005, 2006, Dr. Green received a Fulbright Research and Teaching Fellowship and taught American history at the University of Munster in Germany. A history enthusiast and throughout his life, Dr. Green received an undergraduate and master's degrees in history from Montclair State and Seton Hall Universities respectively, and his PhD in American history from Columbia University. With that expanse of research and teaching over decades and continents, Dr. Green, we are honored that you are with us today to speak about the transatlantic slave trade and the makings of the modern world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, I hope everybody can see my screen. Dr. Green and I are honored to join you for the sixth annual uh, Manly Yamba lecture today. And I would also like to take this opportunity to uh, give my personal thanks to Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Oberi Adu for teaching and inspiring me in the study of this topic and for creating and directing several study tours to Burkina Faso and Ghana uh, on this topic. Today's presentation will cover the outline of topics you see listed here on the screen. For the first half, I will discuss how African gold and African trading empires played a major role in building European wealth centuries before Europeans explored and claimed the Americas. After that, I will explain how this early indirect economic relationship between uh, Africa, Europe, and Asia evolved into the transatlantic slave trade with African women, children, and men captured, transported, bought, and sold as property. We will explore how this trade in African captives and the labor of enslaved Africans built American colonial wealth. Dr. Green will go into even more detail when he analyzes how African labor in the production of cotton became the economic fuel for the new nation, the United States of America and for the world. He will discuss the relationship between the economic dependence on black labor on one hand and on the other, the evolution of white supremacy as a rationale for the subjugation of black people, not only during slavery, but also after the civil war until the present day. By the time of the transatlantic slave trade in the 16th century, Africa had already played a vital role in a new global economy that developed from the middle ages to the 15th century. African products, especially gold, had provided some of the wealth for European economies 
trading companies, monopolies, and the money that funded the European expansion to the Americas and Asia. I'd like you to take a close look at this map of the Mediterranean trade by the 12th and 13th centuries, the end of the, the medieval period. Although we refer to the trade in human beings from Africa as the transatlantic trade, focusing solely on the Atlantic Ocean, it was actually part of a much older trade among Europeans, Africans, and Asians. According to Yale historian Robert Harms, and I quote him, the Asian-European trading relationship was a fundamental step in the African slave trade, playing a crucial role in the development of an integrated global economy in the early modern era. Along with growth and prosperity, trade brought suffering and exploitation. However, nothing comes close to the brutality and human suffering inflicted on human beings in the trans, than the transatlantic slave trade. The misery of African slaves formed a vital link in the trading system that connected the continents, all four, and formed the backbone of the global network of commerce. He goes on and says, the triangular slave trade that linked Europe, Africa, and the Americas was not a closed circuit. It wasn't just that triangle trade we typically think of. Rather, it formed an essential bridge between Europe's New World American trade and its Asian trade. So let us now explore those links. By the medieval period, 15th, the 5th to the 15th century. And before European explorers landed in the Americas, regions of Asia, Europe, and Africa were trading luxury goods, such as textiles, silk, paper, gold, iron, steel, precious and semi-precious stones and spices from Asia, ebony, mahogany, ivory, salt, gold and enslaved people from West Africa and sheep, bronze and wheat from Europe. Land routes using foot and camel caravans crossed from Europe to Asia. Sea routes crossed the Indian Ocean from Africa to Asia and land routes across the Sahara connected Africa to Europe. Let's look briefly at each point of this trade and the role that African empires and their leaders played. What is known as the spice trade or the silk trade brought highly desirable and very expensive luxury products from Asia to wealthy Europeans. These products were so expensive in part because they were hard to get and in short supply. Think of them as today's Hermes purses that can cost up to half a million dollars with a limited number made each year. First, the powerful and wealthy Ottoman Empire and its merchants controlled the source of spices. And second, powerful and wealthy brokers in places like Venice controlled the price, making these products exceedingly rare and expensive. For Europeans then, the challenge is how to get access to these precious products and how to get direct control of the trade without any middlemen or brokers. At the same time that medieval European empires are seeking spices and silk from Asia, they were also part of a Mediterranean trading network that spanned the coastal forests of West Africa to African trading kingdoms and cities, then across the Sahara Desert to North Africa, and finally to Europe. Gold from the West African forests provided two thirds, I will repeat that again, gold from the West African forests provided two thirds of the gold 
in the Mediterranean world by the time of European exploration, explorations in the 15th century. As we look at this leaf from the Winchester Bible of the 12th century, think about this. Centuries before the transatlantic slave trade began, Europeans used West African gold to make jewelry, vessels and property, and pottery, embroidered clothing, gold inlay on manuscripts such as this 12th century Bible, also gold on the manuscript you see on your left, and ivory uh, for the plaque on your right. West African gold was used as money to pay armies and merchants. Much of that gold from Africa then ended up as coinage in European trading centers. Wealthy cosmopolitan Afro-Islamic empires developed along the Sahel. The Sahel, Sahel in Arabic means the coast, shore, or edge. And in this case, it is the edge of the desert. Successive kingdoms ruled over the movement of goods from Europe through the desert to the forest and back. Ghana between 19th, the 19th and 13th century, Mali between the 13th and 15th century, and Songhai between the 14th and 17th centuries. And here on the map, I want to draw your attention to the Sahel empires on that desert edge and the forest empires, which is where the mahogany, ebony, ivory, and gold actually are. So I want you to remember that Ghana, Mali, and Sangai are the kind of brokers, right? They're, they're really at the middle of the, the goods coming from the North, Europe, the desert, and the goods from coming from the South, uh, gold, ivory, ebony, mahogany, and other products. Just as an example, I wanted to draw your attention to Mansa Musa, the 10th emperor of Mali, who was, uh, historians believe, the largest gold producer in the entire world during his reign between 1312 and 1337. So I end this section uh, understanding with us understanding that the relationship between trade among African, European, and Asian empires provided the luxury products and wealth displayed here in jewels, gold, and silks worn by wealthy Europeans and rulers such as Queen Elizabeth I. For the next section, we ask, how does this international trade between Africa, Europe, and Asia evolve to include the Americas and shift Africa from being an indirect trading partner and source of gold to being a source of captive labor in the 15th century? The answer to that question is number one, European expansion, and number two, sugar. After the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama successfully circumnavigates Africa, going from Portugal around the Cape of Good Hope to India in 1498, competition among all the European powers to get access to that spice trade will last for 200 years. Each of the European empires, the Dutch, the French, Portuguese, Spanish, and the English, will create a trading company to get a monopoly over these products in Asia. So the circumnavigation of Africa opens up the continent to direct contact with Europeans, first the Portuguese, but eventually to all European empires who are trying to get an easy route to Asia. Leading that competition, Prince Henry of Portugal also wants to get direct access to that goal in the West African forest as well. And to eliminate those African brokers on the Sahel at that point in the kingdoms of empires of Mali and Sangai. So the Portuguese are going to, when they're circumnavigating Africa, they will establish Atlantic outposts on the Canary Islands, Azores, 
Cape Verde, Teresa plied their ships going around Africa. And from these strategic points, the Portuguese empire is going to spread down the west coast of Africa uh, to include uh, the current day country of Angola. And they will begin to build forts along this coast. And one of the major ones we will look at briefly is El Mina. But it is the Portuguese shifting from trading in gold and ivory and tropical woods to human beings in the 16th century that we will focus on here. The Portuguese will enslave Africans to work on sugar plantations on their Atlantic islands, Canary Islands, Azores, that area. They will also trade their captives to other European empires. When the Portuguese explorer Gabral claims South American territory, now Brazil in 1500, it will create an expanding, highly, highly profitable economic enterprise, a transatlantic business in human cargo that will last for 400 years based on this, uh, the production of sugar. Sugar was the, the crop, the cash crop that laid the foundation upon which African enslavement took root and expanded from that African coast to Brazil and then to Dutch, French, and British, Caribbean, and including Louisiana. So by the time we get to the transatlantic slave trade itself, um, we see that it becomes an old established system. By the time Jamestown is founded in 1619, the enslavement of Africans in the Americas is already a hundred years old and it is already profitable. I want to repeat that. By the time Jamestown is founded, the enslavement of African people on sugar plantations in Brazil and the Caribbean is already a hundred years old. And for almost 400 years then sugar will create an insatiable, increasingly high demand for African enslaved labor. African uh, laborers on sugar plantations will suffer high death rates, low birth rates and high infant mortality Along with, it, along with a low ratio of women to men, meaning that sugar plantations will increase the number of African captives and increase and increase over and over and over again for a full 400 years. The sugar complex was a voraciously hungry monster that needed a constant supply of captive Africans. Elmina Castle, which I mentioned earlier, serves as an example of this transformation from the trade in gold, ivory, and precious, precious woods to a trade in human beings. It was built for gold and ivory, but like all the European forts along the entire African Atlantic coast, like uh, the British fort at Cape Coast in Ghana as well, there were cannons pointed not toward Africa, but pointed to the sea, ready to defend the territory against attacks from other Europeans. Elmina, Cape Coast, and other Portuguese, Dutch, French, English, slave forts along the entire west coast of Africa were used primarily for a trade in human beings by the 17th century with dungeons such as this one, eventually built not for holding precious goods, but precious women and precious men and precious children to be loaded onto boats headed to the Americas. Between 1492 and 1610, the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, French, and the British established political and economic power throughout the Americas, as you see here 
in this list of European explorations to the Americas over a century. Like Portugal, the Spanish monarchy funded successive voyages that resulted in European colonization and exploitation of the Americas, beginning with Christopher Columbus's voyage, sailing, sailing west across the Atlantic as an alternative route to Asia in 1492. When sickness warfare uh, and warfare decimated the native populations of the Caribbean, the Spanish imported African people to grow crops and dig for gold, first in the Caribbean, then later in Mexico and Peru. The Spanish king's asiento allowed other European countries, for example, Portugal, France, and the Netherlands, to bring more African captives to Spanish colonies. So this included the Dutch in the Caribbean and in New Amsterdam, what would later become New York. It included the French empire in the Caribbean and in North America. And of course, it included the British in the Caribbean and in North America. So now having direct contact between Europeans and Africans across the Atlantic Ocean, having created the sugar complex, uh, a sugar complex of a cash crop production that used black enslaved labor, having connected the Americas to this global trade network and wealth, Europeans established the global economy of the modern world. And I remind you, this is before we had the production of cotton as a global product. But in doing this, in using an increasingly efficient system to turn human beings into not only laborers, but property to be bought and sold in the, in the Atlantic slave trade, Europeans created a brand, new, uh, um, uh, a brand new business model to, to make profits off of human beings. The transatlantic slave trade is a trade of African people, manufactured goods, and agricultural products between Africa, Europe, and the Americas between the 16th and 19th centuries. Historians estimate that the human costs included 10 to 12 million Africans brought to the Americas, as well as perhaps another 10 to 12 million who may have died from internal warfare in Africa along inland routes to the African coast and in the dungeons of the slave forts and dying on the ships. By the 18th century, the international slave trade and the African slave labor that produced cash crops and built the colonial infrastructure, Africans were building roads and, and buildings and ports in the Americas, the, this labor played a crucial role in the expansion of the global economy and the creation of individual and state wealth. In British North America, what would become the United States, slavery was codified in law in every colony from New England to the South. Africans built the economies of all 13 colonies. In Virginia, African labor increased tobacco production from 2,000 pounds in 1610, 40,000 pounds annually in 1620, and 1.5 million pounds in 1630. And I want to remind you, we're talking about not something heavy, but something really light. We're talking about the weight of leaves, 1.5 million pounds of tobacco annually in 1630. So while Rhode Island merchants bought sugar from the Caribbean and produced the highest proof rum sold in exchange for African bodies, 
and produce the ships and sails, Virginia has a different economic model that makes money off of black bodies. In New York, Africans built the roads and the buildings and the ports, which is another model of economic profit from African labor. All 13 colonies produce carefully crafted legislation to own, buy, sell, and control black bodies, laws against their movement, laws against their access to wealth and social mobility. Does this sound familiar in terms of 2021? Laws against their human rights, laws controlling their labor, policing and community controls due to fears of black people and the cultural, political, social and economic rationale for enslavement. Although we tend to focus on the wealth of a handful of planters who own thousands of acres and claim to own hundreds of enslaved people, the entire economic enterprise of the British colonies, later the United States, and the world economy relied upon slave labor. So think about this. In addition to the value of slave labor, and the cash crops they produced, the slave trade itself was a lucrative business with, ex with an extensive spread into all arenas of the economies of Europe and European colonies in the Americas like British North America. The global economic network that you saw mapped out earlier included not only the trade in goods and people, but it also created and augmented almost every part of individual, local, and national economies. From making sales for the ships, to insurance and loans for uh, slave ships, to the man manufacture of guns, to the manufacture of cotton, and making chewing tobacco. Lots of people are making money. The trade, the slave enterprise and labor, the production and shipping involved hundreds, if not thousands of types of local and national enterprises. So when you look at the list that is on your screen, we're talking about all kinds of industries feeding this monster of a slave trade. Manufacturing, vendors, people who are doing the brokering, banks and insurance companies. People are making money off of shipbuilding and making sales. There's money made off of the people who make the navigation instruments, the sailors who work on the ships, the people who work on the docks. Money is being made by bookkeepers and accountants. Money is being made by the people who manufacture the guns that are sold on the African continent in exchange for African captives. There are new businesses around those tropical food products when bananas and mangoes and pineapples are introduced into the European diet. There are skilled traders who are producing items to be used on the plantation. There are people, millers, weavers, ironsmiths, are making money off of the enslavement of Black people. And of course, we have people who make a business out of recapturing Africans who run away. It is not surprising then that in 2021, current banks and insurance companies, as well as universities, find that they were quite literally built from the profits taken from Black people's labor. Nothing, though, demonstrates this production of wealth more than a new cash crop of cotton, which did not become a major commodity until the beginning of the 19th century, but in only a few decades became the most powerful driver of plantation slavery and the Industrial Revolution. As I end my screen share, 
and Dr. Green brings up his screen. Um, uh, he will continue the presentation by focusing on the empire of cotton. The national and global economy, slavery and the industrial revolution, the rise of white supremacy. And at the end of his session, we invite your questions and discussion. Dr. Green. Okay, here we go. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Edwards. I really appreciate that very informative um, lecture on, on slavery and the slave trade in the ancient world and bringing it up to the modern era. So I would like to talk about three basic categories, national and global economies, slavery and, and the industrial revolution and the rise of white supremacy. Uh, so I'd like to begin by talking about cotton. I'm not, it's, uh, okay, here we go. Yes, we can see the, the cotton fields and we see a black family or more than one in these cotton fields. And one of the interesting things about this is that in the 19th century, cotton and the South were portrayed in a kind of idyllic way, in a pastoral way. Um, the, the architects of the cotton plantations tried to portray it as a, a benign institution, a non-oppressive institution. Hollywood picked this up with the film Birth of a Nation in 1915 and in the 1930s, a sort of watered down version of it, Gone with the Wind. So to the nation as a whole, cotton was portrayed and attached to the plantation south in such a way as to uh, eliminate the oppressive nature of slavery in the overall depiction of this institution. And in terms of what most people learned about, uh, about slavery, American slavery. So I would like to talk about then the rise of cotton culture in America and the cotton economy. And so as we look at the rise of the cotton kingdom and the expansion of slavery, one of the key factors was the invention of the cotton gin in 1793, uh, approximately. Now, cotton was an old crop. It's actually a pre-Columbian crop. It's an ancient crop. It was grown in uh, Mexico, um, in the Yucatan Peninsula. It was grown in Peru uh, by pre-Columbian Amerindian populations. It was grown in Africa. It was grown in India. And uh, from India, it expanded also into China, ancient crop. But there were a number of factors that made crop always a subs uh, cotton always a subsidiary crop. One of those factors, of course, is that it had to be grown in a warm climate. The second factor was it was very laborious to separate the seed from the cotton. It took a tremendous amount of time to do that. And then it took time, of course, to weave the cotton into um, a cloth. Therefore, cotton did not dominate the uh, transatlantic uh, trade uh, and trade in the Mediterranean and trade to Europe. However, Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin provided a means by which one could very mechanically separate the seed from the cotton. At that point, cotton took off and it will replace tobacco as the major staple of Southern agriculture. Some rice grown in South Carolina, some sugarcane in Louisiana, but cotton is grown from Virginia 
all the way down the Atlantic coast to Florida and to the and 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 to the southwest, which would then been would have been uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, East Texas. So cotton created the economy in these Gulf states. It created this plantation system that moved off of the Atlantic coast and spread throughout the South. And it solidified the South's commitment to slavery. Some have suggested as tobacco profit margins decreased due to um, wearing out the soil, declining soil fertility that maybe Virginia would have moved in the direction of emancipation. We do see some increases in manumission. That means that the rate at which uh, people became free. Uh, so, uh, and received manumission papers. We do see a, a somewhat of an increase in that in the post-revolutionary war period in Virginia, but I would add nothing to let us say, threaten the existence of slavery in Virginia. I'm not suggesting that in any way there was, Virginia would have emancipated uh, the black population there at any point, but we do see an increase. But one thing is very clear what the cotton gin did. It solidified the South's commitment to slavery because here mega profits could be made. And this is very critical. Also, it contributed to the Indian removal. As the Indians of the Southeast, of the Carolinas, of Georgia, and later Florida, the Seminoles, they were removed westward to what will later be called, if you look at the old maps, Oklahoma territory, or what will be called Indian territories, where the present uh, state of Oklahoma is. We had this ethnic cleansing of Southeast Indians in order to make way for the plantations, what will be the new cotton South. So as I tell my students, don't assume that ethnic cleansing is something that happened in some distant land across the waters. It happened here very quickly. And I should point out that the Indians that we are talking about is not simply the Cherokee that we associate with the Trail of Tears. There were a number of other tribes, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and most of the Seminoles from Florida were all moved into that Oklahoma territory. I've even talked with some uh, a person from the New Jersey Indian office who was both a, a descendant of Cherokee and Lenape Indians. The Lenape Indians were the Indians here in New Jersey. And some of them will end up in the Oklahoma territory as will Indians from the Midwest. One thing is very clear, the growth of the cotton industry and the profits to be made from it from the textile mills to the plantations themselves, doomed any chances of Southern emancipation and therefore contributed to the causation of the Civil War. If we think about it, there were only two societies in, America, in the Americas in which slavery was eliminated through violence. One was, of course, the great Haitian revolution with Toussaint Louverture, as they overthrew their French colonial uh, uh, masters. And the other was the American Civil War. In those other societies, it was eventually eliminated by national legislature. But here, the mega profits made by the plantation owners and the textile mill manufacturers of cotton, in a sense, um, prohibited any national legislature from moving in that direction. 
The other aspect of what cotton did is that it increased the domestic slave trade, the interstate slave trade. One of the things that we know is that by the time the production of the cotton gin gets going strong in the latter part of the 1790s, the transatlantic slave trade will exist in America only till 1808 to the British to 1807. America will eliminate the transatlantic slave trade. So where are the workers coming from on those plantations that are being established all throughout the Gulf South and the Southern Atlantic seaboard. They're being, they're coming from places like Virginia and Maryland, the Chesapeake area, former to, tobacco com, uh, uh, colonies that are selling people into the lower South. They're selling them into uh, the Gulf South. This is where a large number of the new cotton enslaved black people are moving to or being forced to move to is into these areas. It's been estimated that approximately a third of black families were broken up by the domestic slave trade. It's important to note then the way in which the transatlantic slave trade and the domestic slave trade are connected. They can outlaw the transatlantic slave trade because they have an enslaved population in the upper south and Virginia is willing to sell their population of, of enslaved workers into the south because they can make a lot of money on the domestic slave trade, which is one of the reasons that America can bow out of the transatlantic slave trade. Here is the Book uh, Corporation. It began in Lowell, Massachusetts, and will have many textile mills all across the uh, uh, all across Massachusetts and New England. It is a major source of industrial manufacturing of cotton. Cotton becomes the miracle fiber of the 19th century. Here is Manchester, England. Okay. Um, what you don't see is Manchester, England was often referred to as cottonopopolis. Cotton Opalis, I should say, Cotton Opalis, because so much of its 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 uh, livelihood was dependent upon on on spinning cotton, southern produced cotton into uh, a fabric. It began in the 1780s, 1770s, I should say, with uh, water power and then it will later move toward steam power. This is in France, uh, near Al the Alsace region in Northwestern France. Here we see women textile workers in France, spinning basically Southern cotton. The textile industries of Europe are relying on Southern cotton which is so um, important. I should add in Manchester, by the way, by 1900, 65% of the world's cotton is made in Manchester, is made in Manchester, is made in Manchester, England. So let's return to the domestic slave trade. We can see how profitable slavery was just by looking at the prices. A male field hand would have in, in today's um, economy cost $35,000. So the domestic slave trade was very, very profitable. 
elderly and children were not so desirable because of the lack of work they could do in the fields, although they were put into the fields at an early age and kept there. But the, we, can, we know that the prices for male slaves was much higher. And for women slaves who were uh, women of, of uh, childbearing age, the prices were much higher. The fear of fear was used as a control mechanism in slavery, that if you rebelled or were insolent or tried to run away, you or your family could be sold apart. So the domestic slave trade was also used as a weapon. It's important to know that in the 1820s, approximately 150,000 uh, people were sold per decade into the Southwest. The Southwest at that time was called Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, East Texas, Tennessee, the Arkansas, that area. We find that 50% of those people enslaved in the Upper South were moved involuntarily into the Southwest by the time the Civil War began. So what I'm suggesting is that we had a massive domestic slave trade going on even after um, uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade was ended. And if we were to take a look, we could find that uh, we, we see the infrastructure um, of that trade, uh, coastal shipping. We think of transatlantic shipping, but there was a coastal shipping from the upper south down to the um, south, south Atlantic seaports, to Charleston and, and to Savannah and to Florida and to New, all the way to New Orleans, as well as you could see wagons filled with people being moved over the roads going south. You could even see coffles of folks being marched uh, southward, in some cases after getting off the boats or these wagons. So there, is, there are elements of this that look a lot like the transatlantic slave trade, but going on in the domestic area. And so we find these coffles that we're talking about, some even moved by railroads. This is a slave auction house in Charleston, South Carolina. Most of the uh, uh, slave auction houses have been taken down, which is unfortunate because it, it allows some to kind of minimize what went on in America with this domestic slave trade. But if you were to visit there, you could see it with the National Park Service. Um, I visited there and it's, it's a very eerie feeling to go in there. Charleston, by the way, in the colonial era, just to having made its money off of, of um, tobacco and rice in particular, Charleston was one of the, the richest city in America. The wealthiest city. We always think of the financial capital as New York, but the wealthiest city was Charleston. Here is one of the um, advertisements or put in the paper by this individual, Thornton Copeland, who's talking about being reunited with his family and his wife, Betty, whom he was sold apart from. So now that, that slavery is over, he wants to be reunified. One of the things that happens with the end of the Civil War and emancipation is that black families are trying to reconstitute themselves. They're trying to reconnect and we can see advertisements with this. This is an example of, of the way in which cotton production uh, has grown so, and you could see it uh, in tobacco and rice uh, in the lower left quad quadrant here. And you can see, uh, uh, sugar production here limited to basically uh, Louisiana. And this is uh, 
crops of all different kinds. But here we can see cotton really growing in this whole area. Uh, America has become the producer of cotton for the world. And one other thing I would want to suggest here for the moment is that cotton was America's leading export. This is what the, sh the, the chart shows. Not the South's leading export, America's leading export. In fact, money from cotton was more than half of all other American exports combined. So this indicates the tremendous amount of wealth being made vis-a-vis -vis the cotton trade. And we can see in a way here, I'm just going to move quickly through these statistics, but basically to show you how the black population increases almost sixfold between 1790 and 1860, the Civil War beginning in 1861. And the black population grew the fastest in the newer cotton regions, less so in Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee, Western Virginia, because these were a part of the Appalachian mountain chain that went down through there. So these were not the plantation uh, areas of these states, which tended to be in the Piedmont or the central part, plus the Tidewater region of the coastal part of the state. Virginia had the largest slave population, as you can see, but it increased by only 15% between 1820 and 1860 because they're selling people into the Lower South. And you can see this, this large increase is not the result of the transatlantic slave trade, it's a result of the domestic slave trade as we see it increasing by 209% in, in uh, Louisiana, over 1,000% in Mississippi as well. By 1860, Mississippi and South Carolina had a larger slave population than free population. They had this, these were states with a black majority, which sometimes we associate only with the Caribbean, but in these two particular states, you had a black majority, which also may account for just how racist they were too. Um, because the fear of slave rebellion and so forth was so great. These Gulf states, Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana had a reputation even more so than the other slave states for brutality. And so we find that agriculture uh, comprised 75% of the occupations that Blacks were working in at that time. And 55% were involved in cotton, more than half the population. But some were involved in tobacco and hemp, uh, some in sugar, and some were in the skilled trades and, and industries. And this is where we need to think about slavery as not only being an agricultural uh, labor system, it was also an urban labor system. A lot of the carpentry, the blacksmithing, uh, iron working, barrel making were in fact done by skilled black artisans in the uh, slave artisans in Southern cities who will later, once emancipation gets going, are frozen out of the skilled trades. And we find that tobacco was important, uh, still important in the upper parts of the South. I'll skip over that. Cotton was the most valuable of all slave produced crops. And, and, and we can see that in terms of the dollar value of it. And by 1860, out of the two and a half million slaves employed in agriculture, one uh, over a million eight hundred fifteen thousand were involved in cotton production. And cotton production rose from ten thousand bales, ten thousand bales, in 1793 to over four and uh, four and a half million cotton bales in 1860. 
And Mississippi and Alabama had the greatest concentration of plantations with 100 or more slaves. During the harvest season, adult slaves would pick 200 pounds per day of cotton. And you know how light cotton is. It's a tremendous amount of labor, sun up to sundown. This is a quote from Frederick Douglass. We have men sold to build churches, women sold to support the gospel and babes sold to purchase Bibles for the poor, heathen, heathens all for the glory of God and the good of souls. The slave auctioneer's bell and the church going bell chimes in with each other and the bitter cries of the heartbroken slave are drowned and the religious shouts of his pious masters Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand. Here, Douglas is calling out the hypocrisy of Christian slave owners and Christian slave masters in his autobiography published in 1845. Here's Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, who supports him when uh, um, um, Douglas flees slavery in Maryland. I should point out, Douglas starts out as, uh, as someone enslaved on a tobacco plantation, but he ends up fleeing slavery as a skilled artisan enslaved in the Baltimore shipyards as a caulker. He flees north, he becomes um, the most well-known anti-slavery speaker on this anti-slavery lecture circuit. His autobiography, The Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass becomes the best-selling slave narrative. He becomes uh, a publisher of Frederick Douglass paper, North Star. This is what he's doing to sell the, the people on the need to oppose slavery. And I want to point out too, that African-Americans of course resisted slavery. This is the Prosser uh, a sign out, outside of Richmond, Virginia, where one of the largest, if not the largest slave conspiracy existed. And the Prosser rebellion as the sign indicated they intended to march into Richmond and capture the governor, James Monroe, and force him and other leaders to support political, social, and economic equality. But their conspiracy was betrayed. This was the problem, of course, as you tried to build a larger and larger network for a slave rebellion that someone might betray it. But what is interesting about the Gabriel Prosser Rebellion, the Nick Nat Turner Rebellion, the Denmark Vesey conspiracy, is the way in which Blacks who were converted to Christianity converted Christianity into a vehicle for Black liberation. So as we say, there was a conversion to Christianity, but the conversion of Christianity to their needs. White Southerners lived in fear, as Thomas Jefferson said, they feared the, the, the fire bell in the night that would indicate that slaves were rising. This led the Southerners to have a kind of schizoid personality. They defended slavery as a benign institution. They proclaimed that slaves were happy on the plantations, yet they established a whole elaborate system of slave patrols, laws, with severe penalties from amputations to execution for those who ran away or rebelled. And the whip was constant. But here, how did they defend this lucrative institution aside from the lives of, uh, of happy slaves on the plantation and non brutal One was a biblical defense, a historical defense, a racial defense that the Bible 
countenance slavery, historical defense that all great societies were based on some form of hierarchy and some form of enslavement. A racial defense that blacks were indeed an inferior race and therefore the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, of liberty of freedom should not apply to them because they were inferior. And they proclaim that slavery uplifted by people, promoted civilized progress. And of course, it was an economic necessity. But here they defend, they needed to defend it morally, not just on the basis of economic necessity, because they were coming under attack in the 19th century by those involved in the abolitionist movement, like Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, for example. To give you one example, and I need to move on very quickly, uh, this is a Thornton Stringfellow, Southern preacher, professor of theology at one of the Southern colleges. And basically he's proclaiming that in his work, scriptural and statistical views of slavery, that in all of the Roman province, provinces, churches were planted by the apostles and slavery existed. Stringfellow also asserted that Jesus Christ recognized the institution as one that was lawful. He ignores all those parts of the Bible that would call slavery into question, needless to say. And he would point out that Jesus Christ had not abolished slavery. So this is also a part of the biblical defense of slavery. Let's look at John C. Calhoun, former vice president, senator from South Carolina. He sort of epitomizes a number of different people. So I'm gonna move on to, with him to talk. This is a speech he gave in 1837 on ta tabling anti-slavery petitions. Basically, he is saying here, he, he doubles down on Aristotle's defense of slavery. It wasn't racial slavery, as we know it from ancient times, but some people were suited to be slaves. And so he then adds the corollary to Aristotle, which wasn't there. Black people deserve to be slaves. That abolition and the union cannot coexist. That abolition will lower the condition of whites. And he has, states here, he holds that there's never, there never has existed a wealthy and civilized society in which one portion of the community did not in point of fact live on the labor of others. So this is the historical defense to make the nation and make slaveholders and others who were ignorant of the reality accept slavery. And here I think is very, very important in understanding the connection to contemporary racist thinking. He, he states in this speech that lifting blacks to an equal level with whites, like abolition, to begin with, via emancipation would soon find the present condition of the two races reversed. They and their Northern allies would be their masters and we the slaves. He was very much articulating these fears. And at a later time, I'll tell you how they resonated with Northerners as well. This is General Oliver Otis Howard. Now I wanna move into the Civil War, the war is over and blacks are free as a result. But some would say free with, no, with nothing but the clothes on your back is not really free. And so what we get is the famous 40 acres and a mule. I'm gonna summarize this. Basically, Howard issued a circular 13, setting aside 40 acres. The original title of Freedmen's Bureau is the Bureau of, of, Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. The abandoned lands by fleeing Southern pro-Confederate slaveholders now fell into Union hands. He wanted to circulate those, distribute those lands, and give them to the freedmen. William Sherman, General Sherman also did something like that on the South Atlantic, South Atlantic coast of Georgia. Andrew Johnson countermanded both of those 
order. And in the, the couple of instances where the redistribution had begun, those lands reverted back to the slaveholders. This is the first real talk of reparations, but without the use of the term reparation. It was blocked and never to be considered again. This is a letter from Miriam Howard, and I conclude with this. No relation to General Otis Howard, a former Mississippi slave. And he writes to General Otis Howard, which is in the National Archives, his displeasure over the return of land and failure to distribute land to those who had been in bondage. No land, no house, not so much as a place to lay our head. Despised by the world, hated by the country that gives us birth, denied of all our rights as a people. We were friends on the march, brothers on the battlefield, but in the peaceful pursuits of life, it seems that we are strangers. How quickly the North and the United States forgets that when the war ended, 10% of the Union Army and Navy was Black. Black, play, black people played a part in their own liberation. They were not simply the recipients, they were the activists as a part of it. Thank you. And I shall uh, return the share. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Edwards for your your very important and informative inf um, presentation. I'd like to now open the uh, floor or the chat room to questions for question and answers. Um, I do have some questions that Samantha, who was um, going to be our moderator today, but she took um, she was um, ill today. One of the questions that she wanted to ask was: To what extent do we see the remnants of the transatlantic um, trade? playing out in our current global trade. Well, I'll, I, will, I will start off by uh, making some comments and then turn it over to uh, Professor Green. Um, um, I think the inequities we see uh, on a, both a domestic scale here in the United States as well as uh, uh, worldwide are part of this uh, imbalance of both power and um, uh, you know, profits from industrial revolution that we have inherited, in fact, from both the, the transatlantic slave trade era itself. And as Dr. Green has pointed out, the kind of uh, extraordinary wealth created um, uh, in the 18th and especially in the 19th century that produces the industrial revolution. And it's that industrial revolution that feeds into the kind of corporate structures we have today. Now, this is when the power of railroads, you know, the power of uh, brand new industries and the extraordinary wealth of, you know, Rockefellers and the Fords and car industry and all of that is fed from this industrial revolution. And so one of the things Dr. Green and I had talked about is the ways in which not only the enslavement of black people is part of the inequalities, but as he uh, uh, revealed in the end of his talk, the nation becomes complicit in creating structures of inequity after the Civil War as well. So that means in terms of uh, 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 houses, jobs, access to education, everything you could put as an indicia for mm. social, economic, political equality and participation in the benefits and profits of an industrialized society, Black people in America uh, Native American people in America are left outside of that entire enterprise that we know, and you've seen the numbers, right? You've seen the numbers that Black people themselves built. Take that scenario and you place it on the African continent and it plays out 
in a very similar way of these gross centuries old, right? And sometimes people do forget we're talking about centuries old inequalities that raped African nations, not only of human beings, but raped them of economic power. And that's even before colonialism. And so then we put colonialism on top of that kind of coming out of, uh, as Dr. Green said, the end of the slave trade actually takes us into a new form of inequity, which is European colonialism on the continent of Africa, which continues, which continue to exploit. And then of course today, the kind of intricate nature of the global economic system has not been undone. So even though African nations have independence, that is not a complete economic global independence. The inequities are sustained. And so they are sustained here in the United States and those inequities are sustained in Africa. They're sustained in the Caribbean, which we can't leave out. Uh, and also sustained in Brazil. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would just add, we can see it in terms of uh, low wage labor and the way capital uses it. For example, we have immigrants coming into America, both legal and illegal, and they're exploited. Uh, we find in the Imperial Valley in California or in, uh, uh, crops um, in the American South, um, tobacco, for example, there's a tremendous use of immigrant labor that comes in, migrant labor, and they're low wage, um, they have very little protection, and they're making very little money. We also find that some of this labor is not only in agriculture, but there are still um, hidden sweatshops in America in which this immigrant labor is used and some even in the domestic. We think of the auction blocks as sort of something of the past, but you can go right down to um, South Orange Avenue, to where South Orange Avenue, Scotland Road connect, make a right onto Scotland Road and go right down to where Scotland Road and Central Avenue is, and you will see large numbers of Hispanic men waiting there to negotiate a day's work for minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got that. And so you have domestic capital still searching out the lowest possible uh, labor that it could have. And the th second thing is you also have capital searching out low wage labor in foreign markets. Mm -hmm. and, and that's going on now as well. Um, so slavery in the plantation, slavery is one means of exploiting labor. Mm -hmm. But I would just point out that even though the Civil War ended and emancipation occurred, and this is true in the Caribbean, plantation economies went on. And they went on in great part because it wasn't a redistribution of land. So a lot of black folks that were free in America, in the Caribbean were technically free but they're working for very little wages. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, we still have the remnants of that going on, a more sophisticated remnants, but as, as Dr. Edwards said and demonstrated, it's still going on. We can, you know, uh, uh, Professor Green, I would add to that um, uh, wonderful uh, revelations about how our economy currently works is something as fundamental as um, uh, minimum wage. And minimum wage is not a livable wage, right? You cannot house yourself, eat, feed and clothe children, pay for utilities on a minimum wage. And so people are literally being paid a salary which does not allow them to sustain life and with a kind of national groundswell and certain people fighting against people literally just being able to survive and eat. It's another form of enslavement as Dr. Green has said. 
I, I have a quick question here. This is Dr. Boache. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Green for such a beautiful and educative lecture. My question is, uh, do you think with all that happened during and post transatlantic trade, Africans have learned anything special as we strive for political, social, and economic freedom? That's a, that's a hard question if you're speaking of uh, my brothers and sisters on the continent itself, who I would prefer that they speak for themselves as opposed to me speaking uh, uh, on their uh, behalf. Uh, but I, I, I can say a few things from what I've learned from the good Reverend Dr. Adu, and that is that um, uh, we have inherited throughout the 20th century um, uh, a, a sensibilities of a pan-Africanism, right? And so I think one of the lessons learned we may see it reflected in something like ECOWAS uh, and the idea that um, uh, various forms of African unity is one way to seek uh, African empowerment uh, from sheer, you know, numbers, right? And that there is greater power in, in unity uh, operating uh, against this uh, very wealthy and very powerful uh, Euro-American and Chinese um, economic and political power. Um, and so I would offer ECOWAS as an example of um, I think a, uh, uh, an approach to empowerment um, that is inherited from, I think, a longer history of Pan-Africanism, right, on the continent, Caribbean, um, the United States, and other places in the African diaspora. I would agree with that. I mean, unity in, in opposing exploitation is very, very important. And also uh, to be careful about, uh, the, 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 you know, we, we dissent is something that we always need in discussion and, and so forth. But unity is also very, very important. I keep thinking back to what happened in the Congo with Lumumba, Patrice Lumumba uh, and the exploitation that the Congo suffered so greatly at the hands of uh, King Leopold and the Belgian mining interests there. Um, and, and then this, you know, civil war that occurred. So uh, we need to find ways of discussion, uh, compromise, and coming together for purposes of unity and, and, and obtaining the best possible lives for the people in terms of, of their, their standard of living, their economic development, and, and political freedom. In some ways, Larry, it, it, it occurred to me also, we we're talking about, um, uh, I was thinking of the anti-apartheid movement also oh. in the United States and just the uh, a very assertive push for uh, divestment, for the United States government take, to take a position, the um, uh, demonstrations on college campuses uh, throughout um, throughout the, the, the United States uh, and, a, and a relentless fight uh, to be on the side of ending, ending uh, the um, uh, racial systems of mm -hmm. oppression in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It's another example of that Pan-African understanding mm -hmm. that Black folk need to stand together because those systems of oppression uh, all look very similar. And as uh, uh, Dr. Green has pointed out, they actually are all interrelated. Mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. Dr. Edwards, I wondered if you um, could speak to, well, both of you, the, the, the fourth point that, that a defense was that uh, enslavement prom promoted civilized progress. Do you, do you hear anything like that 
uh, in in the in the defense of um, our continued economic systems today that are almost a defense. Um, if, if, if something's going to be bad for the so-called economy, it just uh, defends the status quo, even though uh, people are hurt because we're going to lose out. We're going to lose wealth. We're going to lose this and that. Do you see any parallels with that almost faith system in the market, that faith belief in the marketplace? Are, are you referring to the idea, the, the, the kind of win-lose proposition that if certain parts of the po population gain, then somebody else loses? And, and just that general, ju that general adherence to macroeconomic theory, almost that, that it's a, it's a, seems often a status quo theory where any changes we're afraid of what's going to be lost. It just, it just resonated when I, when, when you mentioned that, that sense of, um, what would be lost to civilization if the structures of, of um, slavery were interfered with. Yeah, but it's, it's all based upon the assumption, both in the past and now, it's all based on the assumption of white supremacy and black inferiority. So, so <laughs> if, if the in, in, entire belief and political and economic position always says, if black people get anything they don't deserve it. And so, you know, the presence and, and affirmations of black excellence and black achievement it, in real terms, in real life is looked at either as an exception because black people are not articulate. And so you get the question, how did you get so articulate, right? <laughs> black people with PhD, right, kind of, you know, kind of, uh, or how did you get so successful or questions about how did you get that job? That question about the superlative nature of accomplishments is, is never posed to white people. You know, the, the assumption of how could you possibly do something great or wonderful, right? And so everything about Black people's accomplishments, ambition, right? Um, I've, I've never heard anyone talk about, other than with Black people, that there's such a thing in America as too much ambition, unless you're talking about a Black woman who's running for vice president. That's too much ambition. Uh, so the, 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 the kind of racial construction about uh, whether, whether we're talking about employment, housing, access to education, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion on any level uh, uh, is combated with a, what I see as a white supremacist position that black people never can or could deserve any of this and to give uh, black people equity and inclusion has to in some way undermine the larger national enterprise as if we are not part of the larger national enterprise. So if you, if you kind of put on, try and see the world through this egregious, I would say even evil and irrational white supremacist lens, then the assumption always is, I mean, you, you hear the same language in terms of immigration, that somehow, somehow, <laughs> some people are going to lose jobs, right, because of an increase in, in immigrants, right, or somehow people are going to lose jobs because Black people are included. There is no statistic on the planet that shows that to be true. And so what, what it is difficult for people to see for our society and all societies is the better everyone does, it is a win-win, right? It is a win-win. There is no such thing as that 19th century, Rome is so great because it had slavery. Well, you know what? There is no Roman Empire anymore. <laughs> you know, this is what Calhoun was trying to, to say 
um, I think, in, in the end. It's a zero-sum game. If, if, if Blacks win, then white people have to lose. This is what he's saying. And the interesting thing is, if we look at the white South, we find that 75% of whites in the South didn't own slaves because they were too poor. And we always think of Blacks as in the post-slavery period as sharecroppers and tenant farmers, but so were poor whites. So elites in the, in the, in the pre-Civil War period were telling poor whites in the South that if emancipation came, you would be worse off. Well, they're already worse. They're already poor. And also, if you take a look at uh, the people with the anti-immigrant attitudes today, capital tells them that you know we can't allow immigrants in here, but yet capital brings in low-wage immigrants. At the same time, capital shifts those industries out of the Rust Belt into low countries where low wages and non-unions are tolerated. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have to educate the entire population, both uh, black and white and, and, and Hispanic and Asian, that this kind of game that elites play, playing one off against the other, only enriches these elites at the top. Right, right. I have one more last question that was emailed to me. Um, I'll just read the question to you. It says, since the top subtopic of the lecture is about slave trade and therefore slavery, I have an observation. I look at a country like Ghana with a lot of division ethnically, um, same unfortunate situations happens in a lot of African countries. The situation is so bad in a place like Ghana to the extent that is a section of claiming ownership of the entire land mass of the country without any historical evidence. There's so much racial division, no unity like we had during Dr. Nkrumah's time. The politicians now incite ethnic divisions to get their tribes to vote for them, to win elections. No love of country has been preached like during the president's um, time. My question is, what should we Africans in the diaspora do to push leaders of Africa to try to unite all ethnic groups in the various countries to foster unity so we can prevent foreign countries like China from colonizing and making us slaves all over again on our own land? Uh, that's, uh, I, I, I see Dr. Yamba, I see Dr. Yamba smiling, thinking, thinking who's going to take on that answer? We should pass it on to you, doctor. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm glad it's addressed to the major boss, you and Dr. Green. <laughs> uh, that's a weighty question. Um, let me let me just take a stab at it. I'll I'll give it my best shot quickly. Number one, what we see in um, many African nations is an inheritance of divisions that were actually created by the colonial structures itself. As I say to my students uh, when I'm teaching them, number one, think there is no such thing as Africa until. Europeans create that as something more than a landmass. That black folk are not calling themselves African. They actually are calling themselves, right, uh, um, uh, you know, Fulani or Mende or Iba or <clears throat> Kikuyu or, you know, Baganda or Zulu or Sotha. You know, that's what people are. That is their inheritance. And then European colonial powers come along and draw lines and say, you are part of a colony. And then they create inequities within those colonial structures among different ethnic groups. And that becomes exacerbated in independence. And so there's an a colonial inheritance of division. I'm not sure if it helps to kind of double down on teaching that those divisions are historical and especially exacerbated by colonial rule itself so that there's a sense of um, 
uh, of in some ways defying those colonial structures um, as a part of black agency and autonomy and not living in those divisions. But the second part I would say, uh, I, I would say that the struggle for unity among Africans is, is also no different than it is among all of humanity. And I don't think, you know, we think of Europe or Europeans as some kind of, you know, kind of single entity. And we have at least two major world wars to tell us Europeans really don't see each other as, as being the same. Um, and we know that within those European societies, there are some um, uh, major inequities, right? And disagreements and, and pejorative ways of looking at people. And so my, my, my sense of kind of humanity is that human <clears throat> beings, uh, though the, 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 our, 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 our imperfections that we especially recognize um, uh, for those of us who are Christian, we recognize just how imperfect we are. I do not have a higher bar for Africans achieving a higher mm -hmm. level of perfection than any other group of people on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there are political, social, economic, and cultural measures people can take to head toward unity. But I don't expect um, that uh, impossible bar of, of perfection and perfect unity. Yeah, Dr. Green, if I may, Wayne, and I think you're absolutely right, um, not, not to be defensive in terms of what is happening in Ghana, uh, but clearly growing up in Ghana and seeing you know, the evolution of Ghana since independence, I mean, clearly, uh, I think the so-called uh, ethnic or tribal divisions are somewhat exaggerated. Uh, when you travel throughout Ghana, Nobody holds that against you. Uh, the politicians may have exacerbated the situation. And clearly when you look at our first leader in terms of Nkrumah, Nkrumah tried to build mm -hmm. Ghana out of all these various groups that constituted the then Gold Coast. But sadly, Ghanaians and Africans in general, we allowed outside forces to sow those seeds of division. And by sowing those seeds of division, it was a means of control. Uh, but I really don't think, uh, you know, the question that was posed is really the reality. Uh, in fact, uh, when you go to Ghana, you can travel from north to south. Yes, we have names for the various tribes, but I think we, there, there, there's a pride that this is a tribe that you belong to. It is who you are, it defines you, but it does not necessarily diminish your value. Now, the political structure that has evolved, and I think the in politicians that you're talking about, at the end of the day, those of us in diaspora, our concern is not so much the tribal divisions, but what the politicians do to really build up their own personal wealth. The corruption, I think that's more pernicious than the ethnic divisions that are being portrayed. Well, thank you um, for your for the really amazing lecture. I, I, I just learned so much tonight. Um, so I think that we're gonna close now and I just wanna remind everyone that this event was recorded and we do have a YouTube channel, FTP Church NJ. And um, now we'll have a, um, a song by uh, from Gregory just to close the event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all for such a wonderful presentation and, and the information as we were listening to it. It's very much uh, inspiring, but informative in how the context of then and now, we need to know. Uh, forgetting your history is a very dangerous game. <laughs>
beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you. Be blessed. Yeah. Be well, everyone, stay safe. Oh, Be well. Reverend I know. Hope to see everybody Bye. again. Bye. 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 Okay. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.